Welcome to the Leeds Edutainment Podcast, featuring in-depth interviews with people in hip-hop culture, based out of New England. What's going on? What up, what up? What's good, man? How you doing today? Doing great, man. Doing great. That's great to hear. I'd like to welcome everybody to the Leeds Entertainment Podcast. We've got a very special guest today, rapper. You wrote a bunch of other things. Uh, I, was, I for, totally forgot him. King, James Brown of the Underground. Give me another one. Give me another. Th- let me Jukes title man, you. Barbarian. One more uh, time. Jukes Man the Barbarian. <laughs> I know there's another one. Come on, give me another one. Slick Vic the Ruler. And one more for the win. And King of the Crown. There we go. Mr. Rusty Jukes in the building. Yeah. What up? What up, man? So, uh, yeah, everything is good. Things, uh, things are moving in the right direction. Absolutely, man. Or, you know, I always like to when I start these things off, I always go back. You are a Crowns Height, Brooklyn native, correct? Exactly. What was your experience growing up there? Because I've talked to a few rappers from there, but I'm curious to your experience. Um. It, it it was pretty rough, you know what I mean? But it was beautiful at the same time, man. Word. So it, it, I mean, as that's exactly what it was. It was it was rough, but it was beautiful at the same time, man. So I wouldn't even change nothing. It's kind of how I would describe your uh, your music. <laughs> rough, yeah, yeah, right? rough but beautiful. <laughs> yeah. So when did you get into music in that in in that? How were you influenced by music during that time period? Because we're about the same age. I was listening to, to, to hip hop and R&B and, you know, I was heavy into music, period, since I was a child, like real, really young. But I started writing, I was influenced by my uncle at 12, 12 years old. My uncle was an MC, one of the dopest MCs. And, um, you know, he was living with me and, he, you know, once he, when I seen all his composition books of rhymes and, you know, I got a million of his rhymes, you know, locked in my head right now. And, um, that inspired me to put the pen to the pad and, you know what I mean, the rest was history. What was your uncle's name, rap name? His rap name was Rated All. That's my uncle Ray, rest in peace, man. And um, his rap name was Rated All, and so my first rap name was Rated X. <laughs> Where, <laughs> trying to be like him. That's what's up, man. Yeah. What, besides, besides your uncle, who, else, who are your other influences? I mean, all of the, all of the fucking the pioneers, the greats, man, from uh, Slick Rick, Dougie Fresh to, you know, um, Stessa Sonic, Grand Pooba, you know what I mean? All all the early greats, man. Uh, Melly Mel, you know what I mean? Everybody from the beginning, man. I watched Crush Groove a million times. Everybody, all the stars in Crush Groove were. So instantly hooked, pretty much, like right yeah. in. Yeah. So when did you start your rap? How old were you when you started your rap career as Rated X? Well, immediately. That was, you know, I started writing rhymes and uh, I had my man, my man Zoe lived next door and shit, man. Rest in peace, my man Zoe. He had he had his, his studio, in the, a home studio in his closet and he called it Coffee Shop Productions, you know what I mean? And all of the dope MCs from the neighborhood, the older dudes, you know, I was meeting there. You know what I mean? Everybody used to come there and record, so... You know, I was recording with him. I had albums with him, like, for years and shit. Yeah, yeah. So when did you change the name to Rusty Jooks? Around 16. Uh, but before that, before that, it was Vic Funkster. And that's that's when I was I was really on it, you know what I mean? I was murdering MCs, you know what I'm saying? And, and that name was my name that I was known by for a long time. You know what I mean? Rated X probably was, like, about a year or something, you know, and I changed it a few times. But um, it was Vic Funkster... And then I changed my name to Rusty Jokes around 16 years old. Word. So first time I hear about you, uh, Sean Price, rest in peace, co-signs you. This is how I first hear Rusty Jokes. Talk about meeting Sean Price and how that all happened. How did um, that happen? My manager, Errol, he was, um, you know, I was doing a lot of work with him. We was putting out singles and going around, um, recording with different producers and shit like that, doing showcases. And, um, you know, he's, his, his cousin is Rock. His Rock is his cousin. And he was like, yo, you know, I want to introduce you to Help the Skelter. They're working on a second album. You know, let's see if you could, you know, get a join in with him or something. So he brought Sean Price around my way. You know what I mean? He went and got him from Brownsville, brought him to Crown Heights. And, um, you know, I met him. We, we clicked. 
You know what I mean? I started spitting all types of rounds for him. He loved it. And, you know, he just took me under the wing from there. You know what I mean? I was I was just traveling over to Brownsville, you know, um, rocking with them in Cephalo Projects and shit. And then, um, you know, they was in the process of recording an album. So I was going to their sessions. You know, they would book like 12-hour sessions in Queens and, you know, different um, studios and shit. And before you know it, I got on the title track and the, uh, the, and the last song called Gang's All Hit. That was on Magnum Force, right? Yeah. 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 What, did, were, you a, were you a boot camp click fan or Helter Skelter fan, Sean Price fan before you met him? Hell yeah. That was, I was yeah. a big boot camp click fan, man. They, yeah. Like, it was, they, their style, that was, that was Brooklyn right there. You know what I mean? The whole fatigues. Timberland, you know what I mean? That changed the whole, that shit changed a lot, man. Like, they they really need to get that credit that they deserve, man. Like, they put Brooklyn on the map. Like, it was a lot of big Brooklyn rappers, man. But at that time, sooner, it was like a, it was like a domino effect. You know what I mean? Black Moon came out. It was crazy. I'm like, oh, shit, Buckshot, Five Feet. Then Smith and Wesson and that whole shit, the whole scenery changed. You know what I mean? Everybody started calling Brooklyn Bucktown. Then the Nocturnal. And the, the old GC with the storm, like it was just crazy, man. Whoa. Which one's your favorite? Shit, uh, I don't know. It, it, it's I might I might have to say, I don't know, man. I might have to say either into the stage or the shining. It's it's tough. out of them two. Tough to beat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> tough. I don't know. So, so you mean you I remember I, I saw you. Sean Price was bringing you on some of his tour dates too, right off the beginning too, right? Yeah, man, I was, uh, you know, that's how I got my, um, I, I learned how to really perform, you know, dope, man. Like I was doing shows and shit, but like going on the road, it really, you know, it prepped me, it prepared me for the big time shit, you know what I mean? And um, he definitely took me everywhere. I got my passport probably like 2004. I was on, you know, going overseas with him. But before that, I was all in the States, you know, doing all the shows with him. And what was that like touring with Sean Price as a person? Man, Sean Price is Sean Price is, is Sean Price, man. He was he wasn't a rap persona. That was really him. So, you know, you know, he just he was just able to put that into the music and everybody loved it. You know what I mean? Cause, you know, they looking at it like, yo, you know, his whole his whole style and the way he say shit and you know what I mean, he's 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 so fucking like barbaric and then he's hilarious at the same time. You know what I mean? Like he could be right. the skinniest dude in the room. You know what I mean? I mean, motherfuckers would be afraid. And then at the same time, he's hilarious. You know what I mean? So it's like, you know what I mean? That shit, that shit was a crazy experience, man. So, you know, touring with him was, was, was fucking amazing, man. I learned how to deal with promoters and, you know, how to perform, perform my shit right to get it across. How did, what did you learn on how to deal with promoters? I'm curious as a promoter not myself. To take, not to take no bullshit, man. Like Sean, Sean was, was very serious about business, man. You know what I mean? And um, so I learned that early on, man. You can't, you can't be acting like these motherfuckers is your friends. You know, everything is business. Feel that. Feel you know, that. Well, they I, luckily, I never had an issue with Sean. I did a lot of Sean Price shows. I did a lot, booked a lot of Sean Price shows, a lot of boot camp shows, a lot, all of it. Yeah. And uh, we never had we never had an issue because I was straight with my business. Um, right, right, right. But we got along, um, and I and I, I did see his his <laughs> his funny side to him and whatnot. And uh, you yeah. were at a lot of those shows. Yeah, yeah. Was one of the was one of the first singles. I want to say one of the first twelve inches I heard from you was Vic Flair. Am I wrong on that? No, because I never put a I never put Vic Flair out as a single. I thought that was out. I thought that was out. What yeah. was one of your first twelve inches? My first, the first one was uh, Live the Life. Maybe that's what it, it was. was. It, it was, a, you know, it was featured on the Duck Down Presents compilation album. That's what it came out first. But then we put it out as a single, a 12 inch. And the B side was Fall Back. It was a song called Fall Back that I had. So that was my first, you know, single, single. For some reason, Vic Flair is sticking in my head. I don't know why. Did you used to do that live a lot? Is that what Flair, it was? Vic Flair, I did that in 2006. So that came later on. You know Damn. what I mean? <laughs> the life and, and fall back was like uh, two thousand. Yeah. yeah, yeah, because I think that was one. Of, that was one of my um, first big joints. That was my first video. You know what I mean? That was my first video, Vic Flair. And um, maybe you know, that's what it was. That shit to this day. 
I'm going to perform it this weekend in, in um, San Diego. <laughs> That's what's up. So yeah. is Indestructible, is that your first technical album or is that a mixtape? What was that of course, in regards to everything? Was it technically album. an album? Yep. Because I wasn't sure because it said Sean Price Presents, so I couldn't remember was it done. Because back then That's it was mixtapes and albums. They put a stamp on it, man. That's how they, you right. know, they labeled it. You know, when it came out, when it starts off with Sean Price, you know what I mean? Everybody going to check it from there instead of just coming out with Rusty Jukes Indestructible. You know what I'm saying? So that's what it was called. Yeah, so let's so backtrack one second because you just brought something up, point that I wanted to bring on. You knew Sean when he was doing Strictly bef- Health of Skelter, correct? When, right. Before he went solo? Right. That transformation, because I'm curious, you were right there. That transformation between him being in, you know, Helter Skelter, then the Sean Price character. Was that always there bubbling or was that an intentional thing he did or was it just a natural progression? I mean, well, it was, you know, he 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 had to go solo. You know, he wasn't um he wasn't on the label, you know, they they kept rock on the um, I forget which label they was on, but um, you, you know, they kept rock, rock had a deal, and um, so Sean had to go solo, and you know, he just you know, everybody knew him as Ruck from Helter Skelter, but he was always saying Sean Price or Sean in a, in a song. So you know what his name was already. And so, you know, he just went, sh- you know, straight with Sean Price. I forget the name of the first fucking single, man. Oh, man. Like, mm-hmm. that one set it off. And it was like, yo. Like, yeah, he could keep it. Oh, you unmuted yourself. You muted yourself. Hold up. Somehow you muted yourself. Somebody was trying to call in. So yeah, you know when he when he did his first single, um, you know that just set it off. I mean, he just kept going and just get it kept getting greater and greater. Yeah, because it seems like the the health of skelter stuff was a little more chilled out, like for him compared to what I've seen him become with Sean Price. It was a more aggressive, this big larger than life character. Whereas he was, I don't know, it just seemed like he was he transformed a bit. You know what I mean? In my opinion. Would you agree? Yeah, he just he just um he just evolved. You know what I mean? Everybody, everybody evolved over the years, man. Word. That's and it worked. All. And it worked really well. He definitely did, man. Because he was a whole new, it was like he was a whole new MC, you know what I mean? And that must have been crazy for you though, right? Because you're right there, right? He's co signing yeah. you. How did you feel about being next to this larger than life character? Like that yeah, must have been crazy. Like, yo. That was that was my big bro in real life, man. And um, you know, beyond the music. So he was always somebody I looked up to and he always, you know what I mean, he he did everything he could for me. You know what I mean? He put me in positions like shit that he did for me, um, is still working out for my benefit now. You know what I mean? And um, so I, you know what I mean, I oh, that's why I got so many songs, you know what I mean, dedicated to Sean since he passed. I did like five, six rest in peace joints. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, and that cosign early, a cosign early in your career must have gave you some good confidence of like, yo. Yeah, yeah, and it, and it also gave me the, you know, the the um the fan base that Duck Down has. You know, what I mean, they built a, a dope fan base over the years, and and I was able to, you know, be touring with him, touching the fans and shit. They be like, yo, you know, they they see me as you know affiliated with the greats. You know what I'm saying? So that shit definitely boosted my shit. You talk about duck down. Talk to me about the importance of them because you know we talked about fatigues and whatnot. But talk about duck down as the label and keeping the music going. Talk about the significance there because it's been a powerful movement. Say it again. Talk about duck down. Yeah. Talk about the significance of duck down. Oh well, duck down, been... man. duck down is one of the. Um, we just we just we just celebrated up at Sirius um, FM. For 30 years of Duck Down, man. And this this is one of the greatest independent labels ever, man. Like they still here, st- still putting out content, and it's still relevant. You know what I mean? Like all over. And 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 um, you know, their core, their core, the core fan base is like strong, man. It's always there. Every time we have an event anywhere, it's, it's packed, and you know, everybody's singing the classics and as well as the new shit. So you know what I mean? Duck Down is 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 one of the fucking illest labels, man. Yeah, shout out Drew Ha, No Ha. <laughs> Any other Ha's in there? Yeah. Um, back to you. Your second album that I can remember is uh, The Execution, right? With Marco right. Polo? Right. 
Talk about making that album because obviously Marco Polo is a well Marco um, Marco um you know we knew each other through um through passing like you know through and, and um clubs and um you know different events and shit you know what I mean I I meet him I met him a few times and um he um he was working on his second album he was doing Port Authority Part Two so he hit me up to come through to do a verse and shit you know he had to we recorded at his um at his spot in Brooklyn and um so, you know so I came to lay a verse for that. And when I was there, he gave me like a CD full of, I think it was like eight beats. And I took it home and I body all eight of them shits and came back. And he was like, yo, we might as well do the whole album. And I was like, let's go. And that's how it happened. <laughs> so that's a great album. The other album I want to talk to, obviously, is the Vic, the Vic album, the, the Victorious, yeah, Victorious Impervious Champions. Is, did I get it right? <laughs> yep. With uh, Beantown local producer, The Archetype. Yeah. Um, who I work with a lot and is a staple in this community. Uh, talk mm -hmm. about making that project. Yo, that project was dope, man. All hit me up. And I think we were supposed to just be doing like a song or two or something like that. I forgot how exactly how it started, but um, the same thing, man. Like we, you know, once we did those, those songs, you know, I was loving this production. And, um, you know what I mean? I was like, yo, man, let's keep going. And uh, you know, like all these years later, man, it's, it, we still we still making money off the VIC. Like a lot of our songs got placements on uh, you know TV shows, uh, ESPN, Showtime, shit like that. And um, you know, we did other joints, um, not that that wasn't on the album that's you know that's still getting played. Matter of fact, Archetype produced the joint that um the new boot camp single. We just shot a video for it recently, man. I don't know if you was seeing my post. It's called What You Call Strength, and it's everybody. You know what I mean? Everybody, all boot camp members, and, um, you know, it's produced by the archetypes. I think that's going to drop, like, next month. Word. Word. So it seems to be, like, and I'm looking at... And we song at Rock the Bells in August. Dope. It seems now, as I go through the catalog, I noticed that there's, <laughs> in reading your bio, there's 20-plus albums. <laughs> yeah. I, I can't... I'm not going to go into it. 14 years, word. Now, you talk about this relationship of, like, you, you work with a producer and he gets you a beat, sends you a bunch of beats, and then you end up taking, like, seven or eight beats. And you have a lot of collaborative pro projects. Is that just how this goes for you? Like, they send <laughs> yeah. you a... Basically, um, you know, some... some um, I mean, yeah, that's, like, with everybody that I work with, man. Like, you know, some producers... I could hear myself doing, um, you know, a few songs off of, you know, when I hear a lot of their production and shit, you know what I mean? And I'm always, I've always been a big Gangstar fan, so I love the one MC, one one um, producer concept, you know what I mean? And um, so that's what, you know, every album is a different feel, is a dip, puts you in a different zone. Word. So talk about these, what, name some of these, uh, any particular album has a, an experience that stands out more than another? shit i mean all of them man all of them i don't know which um well i mean it doesn't have to be i'm not saying better but is there like an experience that was different than the others or like something that resonates more because well, i'm just curious 20 well, albums in one of my albums that i did i did it totally different you know what i mean this wasn't one producer my international jokes album i think i dropped that 2017 and that was the album where because you know I'm I'm like, I call myself the killer collab king, you know what I'm saying? So I'm always doing collab with artists from all over the world, you know what I mean? So I was like, yo, you know what? I, I might as well do an album with with my fans, you know what I mean, with that are artists, you know what I mean? So producers, producers hit me up, they sent me beats, and if I liked it, I, I picked it for the album and I set it off and put the hook. And then um, artists hit me up, the rappers, you know, from all over that, even I let everybody rhyme in their own language. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like I have an artist from um from uh from Germany, you know what I mean? He rhyming in German, and then another artist from um another a Swiss artist, you know what I mean? And everybody's and the song always worked out. Like, you know what I mean? I had an artist from DR and then um uh, a Lebanon artist on the same track, you know what I mean? And and the shit, it was it was just it was just beautiful, man. It was called the International Jokes. And so, you know, it was a win-win because Everybody that I had on, I had like, I had a, um two Nigerian, I had a Nigerian artist and a Senegal artist. And you know what I mean? It was just like, wherever this, whoever was um 
you know, either the producer or the rapper, they're promoting it where they from. You know what I'm saying? So they like, yo, I'm on Rusty Jux album, um, the single 13, you know what I mean? Number 13. And you know what I mean? So it was getting promoted everywhere, man. And I shot videos, shot about four videos. So, you know, it was a hard album to put together because I had to get the best MCs and the best producers, you know what I mean? Because it was a lot of people me sending me shit that was, you know, wasn't up to par. But, you know, after I broke through all of that, I put a solid album together, man. And that was a dope experience, man. So these these are the rappers were sending you verses in different languages. Right. So how did you... <laughs> How did you know if it was dope or not? Did you get the translator yeah, because, out? The because just how just how other artists from, you know, that don't speak English, they know that our shit is dope. You know what I'm saying? Like, um, it was a Lebanese artist. Oh, man, I, I'm, I'm, it's a song called I Who Have Nothing, right? And it's um, featuring Cyrus Malachi and um, I forget her name. But she she got so busy, like her flow was crazy. Her voice was crazy. And you could just tell, like, you know what I mean? She had to be saying some shit. You know what I mean? Like, it was just like, yo, like, I mean, it's it's just the feeling. It's the vibe, man. Feel that. So it's like sonically. Yeah, you yeah. Know, you, I, you can I tell that this is... Damn, she killed that shit. And I ain't understand a word she said. <laughs> and that was a lot of the artists. That's fucking... She killed it. I have no idea what she said. Yeah, yeah I don't know what she said, but she smoked that shit. Word. <laughs> you know... <laughs> You're a very active MC. I mean, yeah. I hit I hit you up. You hit me back right away. Let's do this. Let's do the business, whatever. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I feel like a lot of other artists ain't like that. Like, I feel like you are like a working man's MC. Like, you are just, you're on it. Yeah, man. I'm hustling, man, every day, man. I, I can't sit still. I got, matter of fact, <laughs> I got a new single talking about just that, man. A new single mm -hmm. called Work that I'm getting ready to drop, produced by my man, Free One. And I'm I'm talking about that, man. Like, it's, you know, that's why I never really cared to be, um, you know, signed to a major or anything, because I like to do the things the way I want to do it at my own pace, drop singles when I want to drop them, you know what I'm saying? So I don't have to answer to nobody. Yeah, because, I mean, you are turning things out left and right quicker than I would say most art rappers in the that I've seen on a national level. Right, right, man. Yeah, I'm yeah, I got a lot of songs and albums right now. I got about seven, eight albums that's um, you know, getting mixed and mastered. Word. <laughs> me, 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 and, me and Rock, me and Rock got an album. It's called Crownsville. And that shit is, yo, that shit is, I was getting ready to say indestructible, man, but that shit is amazing. It's impeccable. And um, the fans really need this shit, man. You know what I'm saying? I got another album with my man Skanks the Rap Martyr. He's from Crown Heights. You know what I'm saying? That's my brother. And um, it's fully produced by UG from the Cellar Dwellers. And uh, me and Nine got an album, an EP. We got an EP getting ready to drop. We just dropped the first single. It's produced by Snow Goons. And um, you know what I mean? I just got a whole bunch of, a lot of singles and EPs and albums, man. Word. A lot is, a, you know, there's a lot, a lot of MCs that have a lot. You got a a, a lot, a lot. <laughs> yeah, 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 no, nah, for real. And it's and they dope too, man. Like when when motherfuckers hand, they gonna be this ain't no watered down shit. Word. Talk to me about your writing process, because I'm curious how you attack. Because you have to be quick if you're turning out this much music. Are you like? Yeah. Is it like? You hear the beat and it's like 15 minutes. The verse is done. Five half no, hours. Different. Sometimes I take longer than that. Um, you know, it just depends on what the how what the beat is and and what the concept is. If I come up with the concept, you know, I just let the beat tell me. <clears throat> excuse me. I just let the beat tell me, you know, wh where I should go with it. Like if it's a battle rhyme or if it's a story, you know what I'm saying? I, you know, then it, once I come up with, you know, the concept, then I go into it. And some songs I read about something and you know, then I and then I go in, into that subject because I, you know, I read about the whole, you know. A lot of, you know, I get all the facts and details straight and then I put it in rhyme form. And um, those songs always come out the best. That's dope. And uh, so you, so you like try to read and research concepts and try to yeah. gain knowledge on situations. That's, that's dope. Yeah, even when I, even when I speak about guns and like if I say, um, you know, like I, I bust something like a, um, 
uh, um, uh, Glock 19 or something. Like, I read up on different guns that, you know, I don't say the average gun that everybody is say. You know what I'm saying? I'll read up on something and, and, and put that in the ROM and shit. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, because I would think that at this point you'd have a subscription to Guns and Ammo magazine maybe going on. <laughs> yeah, I used to do that. I used to look at I used to read them Guns and Ammo shits, man. Word. <laughs> yep. I want to go back to the boot camp reunion. Uh-huh. That must have been surreal back 30 years later. Everyone's sitting there. I saw the, I saw the the posts and everything. And, and Art yeah. told me he did produce the beat. And um What's that like 30 years later? I mean, I know you weren't there in the beginning. I mean, you were listening, but you weren't there. But what's that like, everybody back in the same room? I'm, I'm happy to be here, happy to be there and be involved with everything, man. And um, you know what I mean? Still putting out that crazy content. I set off the new single so fucking hard, man. You know what I mean? And, and, and all my brothers on there body the song. And, you know, we just, you know what I mean? I, I never get tired of nothing, man. Every time I tour, every time I tour with them, do shows with them, and they go through the classics, like, you know what I mean? I'm there singing all of that shit. So, you know what I mean? It felt great to be a part of a, such a fucking phenomenal group. You know what I mean? Yeah. And where's it? And, and, and everybody, it's positive. Everybody's head's in a good space 30 years later. Yeah. And, they, we nev- and we never broke up. You know what I mean? We don't have no internal issues. With, you know what I mean? Everybody is good, man. So... Right. Uh, and um I think this when this new single come out, man, the fans gonna really gravitate towards it and um, you know, they're gonna want more and that's gonna push us to really, you know, do another boot camp project, man. Word. That's what's up. That's what's up. You know, we got the show coming next week. I appreciate you making an appearance there. Shout out Black Medine, XL the Beast. Oh yeah, yeah. It's going down on the twenty ninth. Word up. Yeah, yeah. You back I'm your... back in the Middle East, man. I've been I've been there a few times, man. I think the last time I saw you perform, you opened up for um, Wally. I think that was the last time. I was at the Middle East? Yeah, downstairs. Oh, it was the middle... yeah. Well, yeah, that was a few years ago. Yeah, yeah. But I think that was yeah, right that before was cold, COVID. Man. Right before COVID. Right, right, right. Yeah, I remember that. So yeah. you also you also refer to yourself as an international tour veteran. Yeah, you know why I came up with that? From Primo. Primo said that in the interview. And it was from one of those magazines. And he was like, Rusty Jux is an international tour vet. And I was like, oh, shit, word? I am. And then I just I started saying that shit. <laughs> so out of all the places you've performed all over the world, what are some of your favorite places? Uh, definitely France. France is always, um, my shows in France always are fucking, like, them shits is lit, man. Like, you know how everybody's saying lit right now, but them shits was fucking crazy, man. And every show. Um... Canada's always, always dope, man. Canada, all over Europe, man. You know what I'm saying? All over Europe, all over Canada, um, in the States. But um, I, don't, I don't think I have my best show yet, man. That's why I'm waiting to get over to Africa, man. I got so many fans out there um, really? in Africa and Australia. And um, I think I'm getting a... I had an African tour set up, man. But when that COVID shit came, it fucked everything up. I was like, damn. I had like five or six shows set up. But um, um, I got something. I got something coming up for Australia soon, man. So I'm gonna see how that shit work out. When you were gonna do Africa, were you gonna do like South Africa or like North Africa? What what? It was part um. Of it? Well, it was um. Where, where, where was it? it? We had we had Senegal. I think it was um. I think it was West Africa. Oh wow! Yeah, it was a West African tour. I forget. That's crazy. I'm sure yeah. it'll happen eventually. And I heard yeah, Australia. I'm gonna get back out there. Yeah, sure. And Australia, New Zealand are usually pretty good markets for hip hop. Yeah, yeah. I gotta, I gotta hit South America. I never hit South America. I hit, I've been all over Japan. You know, seven different parts. Um, but you know, we still, I still got a lot of places to go. What was Japan like? Japan was fucking dope, man. Um, the food was good. The food was great out there. All of the shows was crazy, man. The fans was coming through with with um vinyls and. Rocking duck down shirts or rusty jook shit, and um, I mean it, it was it was a dope experience, man. I enjoyed it. I was out there for like eighteen days, and I had seven shows. So you know, I had a lot of off days with traveling or just chilling, and um, I had a good time, man. So what? So you know, you being the hard body MC, what are we ever gonna get an R and B album out of Rusty Jooks? <laughs> Yo. 
I mean, shit, if I, if I do if I do something with some of my dope R&B artists, you know what I mean? I would love to do that. I mean, because that's what I listen to. I listen to R&B more than hip hop. Like, serious. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm in here singing and shit, you know what I mean? From the from the 70s shit to the 80s to right now. You know what I mean? So. Well, the reason I give it to you, because you never really diverted from what made you great. Not, you know, you're a great writer, but what your style, I should say, mm -hmm. what made you great. You never diverted from, yo, I'm a hard body, grimy. But you know what? I got, a lot of, I got a lot of different songs, man. Like, if you listen to, you know, go to, um, into the catalog like that, man, you'll find different songs, man. Really? And, and, um, and some of the albums I put, you know, I'll put this type of song. I got a lot of inspirational songs, man. Like a okay. lot of those, you know what I mean? A lot of those. Um, a lot of, um, a lot of black power music. You know what I mean? A lot of that. I got a lot of that kind of music. You know what I mean? So it's not always hard body. You know, it's just, it's just, even when I do those type of songs, it's hard body too. So, you know what I mean? It's, that's it's, that's what like, I bet. Yeah, yeah, so, but. You don't soften your tone. You might be talking <laughs> about something else. I got, so, you know. I got like three songs about my wife that, you know what I mean? Um, that, that was dope. You know what I mean? I had a song called, um, Nothing I Won't Do with, um, Forever Chosen singing on the hook. And uh, you know what I mean? That was a smooth joint. You know what I mean? I put that out. That was on my James Brown of the Underground album. Word. That was produced by Amadeus 360, right? Right, right. Hell yeah, he produced the whole shit. Yeah, I had him on here not too long ago too. We talked about that. No doubt. Yeah. So uh, what's next? Anything else in the future? What do we got? I know you talked about what you were working on, but anything else we should uh, know about? Man, just a whole, bunch of, a whole bunch of shit, man. I got new videos on the way. Um, I got a, I got a, a song with my man, Jay Mob. I'm getting ready to shoot the video for tomorrow. And, um, you know, we getting ready to drop that soon. The boot camp single is on the way. Um, my new single with nine is out right now. And, uh, you know, just a whole bunch of shit, man. Nine, dude. Uh. The, show's, the show's coming up, man. I got the 29th, you know what I mean? Middle well, East. And the 24th, I'm out in San Diego, you know what I mean? So, Don't shit, shit is up. Word, man. Well, I really appreciate the time, Rusty, and um, look forward to uh, building with you more at the show next week on the 29th no doubt. In the Middle East. Yeah. Word. I'm going so to take tearing shit down, and, I, I, and I'm going to bring Vic Flair with me. Oh, Vic Flair's back in the building. All, All right. right. We'll end on that. I want to thank everybody for tuning into the Leeds Edutainment Podcast. A very special guest, Rusty Jux, brother. I will see you soon. Salute. Go ahead. Peace.